Violence erupts in a quiet residential street. There are hammers, axes, lumps of wood. It was a pack of wolves essentially attacking. It was just horrific. A teenager has been fatally stabbed. I couldn't handle seeing my son lying dead. I just wanted to know who'd done it. Forensics must act fast to find crucial evidence at the crime scene. It's really important to be able to identify the murder weapon. The team will do everything they can to bring that person in front of the court. Police units are racing to a mass brawl in Eltham. Witnesses claim more than a dozen people, armed with weapons, are fighting in the street and attacking cars. DCI Simon Harding and his major crime unit cover this area of South London. That call describes complete mayhem. Real sort of carnage happening in a very, very quiet, nice residential area. When police arrive, the suspects have already fled. First of all, what you could see was that there was a hammer in the roadside next to some broken glass with a lump of wood that had been torn off the fence. There were bricks, a wing mirror of a car, discarded weapons on the floor, but no victims. Uh, no suspects. Officers immediately seal off the street. Maintaining a crime scene and its integrity is difficult in certain types of weather. You can find those obvious exhibits, but then there are things that are very difficult to see in the dark, like blood. Sarah Thurkel has 30 years experience in the field and is one of the UK's leading forensic trainers. The first rule of a CSI at a crime scene is to establish a cordon and a common approach path. They would have cordoned off a huge area to preserve any evidence that might have been dropped as the offenders were fleeing the scene. You've got passers-by that might pick up items that you've not seen because it's dark. Footprints might not be preserved properly. Photography in low light would take quite a long time to do. It's a very, very difficult scene for any crime scene manager to control. There was hammers, bits of wood, bricks, etc. These would have been a priority to try and get the maximum DNA evidence from them. And initially, they might not appear to be a weapon of choice to assault somebody with. So as a crime scene manager, you have to try and prioritise what you think might be a weapon. An update comes through from the local A&E department. One of the pieces of information that comes in is that potential victims that are at hospital. Two boys have been stabbed. The stabbed victims are 18-year-olds, Charlie Pamphlet and Jay Sewell. I was just about ready to go to bed. And then a knock on the door came and I thought it was Jay. And I opened the door and his friend Alfie was standing there and he just said that Jay had been stabbed. He's been stabbed but he's all right, he's stable. And at that actual point, I remember that I did collapse to the ground and said, thank God. Jay's mother Sharon and her two younger children rushed to the Queen Elizabeth Hospital. When we went into the A&E, I went up to the counter and I just said, Jay Saul. And then with that, I was immediately ushered 
through to the back and it was sort of there that the police were and um and I me and the Jake and Chloe we were sort of like ushered into this little uh, oh, little box room I knew I knew then I knew Sharon's worst fears come true her son Jay has been murdered Chloe just Jake just broke down and I felt sorry, I felt sorry that I'd put them right in the front line of it all. Me, I was just shouting. I just wanted to know who'd done it, what had happened. I said they, they were gonna clean him up so I could see him. But I couldn't handle it. I couldn't handle seeing my son lying dead. Jay's friend Charlie is in a critical condition. A murder investigation is launched. When a teenager is killed in London, it's one of those things that really sparks um, sadness in a lot of people because it, people in the prime of their life are having it taken away and, and always needlessly. There's two people been stabbed, we know that, and one has died, but we don't know who's done it. Jay's body is taken to the mortuary for a post-mortem examination. Jay becomes a crime scene, and so he will undergo a number of tests himself, and some of them are incredibly intrusive, and post-mortems are the most intrusive of all. But these are necessary things that a person, unfortunately, has to go through for us to be able to get the best possible evidence to find the person, ultimately, that killed them. He had to have two autopsies. They did try to sort of make it where he could be viewed, but it was too distressing. Detectives learned that Jay died from a single stab wound to the chest. Knowing that they caused the death of the stab wound, the priority is to try and find that knife. The CSIs continue to search the extensive crime scene and detectives at the hospital question witnesses, including Jay's girlfriend, Gemma, who drove him away from the attack site. The story started to unravel very quickly. She gave a story around a ex-boyfriend being involved, along with a number of other people. There was possibly up to 12 people involved. When you've got so many people, it's very complex to start with. You need to know who they are and get them as quickly as possible. I have to understand the role that every single one of those people played within that murder. Eighteen-year-old Jay Sewell has been murdered. His friend Charlie remains in a critical condition. Jay's girlfriend drove them away from the crime scene to the hospital and claims they were set upon by a large gang led by her jealous ex-boyfriend. She gave a story around a boy she named as Daniel Grogan being involved. What we weren't getting straight away was who stabbed Jay Sewell. With that many suspects, the, it's a time critical part of your investigation because they've got time to start to dispose of evidence, getting their stories in some form of shape to try and help each other out or help themselves as individuals. Witnesses tell police that some of Grogan's relatives were amongst the gang. In the middle of the night, a specialist team surrounds the family home. We know that there are hammers axes being talked of, lumps of wood. What we're doing at that stage is bringing in those people who can deal with large-scale arrests of people that are potentially violent. And that's when the Metropolitan Police's Territorial Support Group are called to effect an arrest in the early hours of the 12th. 
the Grogan house is close to the attack site. Armed police are in position, ready to make the arrests. The family were called out of that address by loudspeaker, one by one. Torches are lighting up the front door. Tasers are trained on each one as they come out. All the red dots are there ready. Out of the house came mum, dad, sister, sister's boyfriend. Some of them are quite nervous. Mum comes out shaking. The mother is 55-year-old Anne Grogan. Witnesses at the crime scene claim she was seen carrying a knife. The father, 58-year-old Robert Grogan, was alleged to have swung an axe. The sister is 30-year-old Francesca Grogan, and her partner is 32-year-old Jamie Bennett. Both were identified to be holding hammers concealed in towels. What we didn't have was Daniel Grogan or somebody else that had been named Charlie Dudley. And we knew still that there was potentially more people involved. At the police station, clothing from the suspects in custody is seized. If the suspects are arrested within a few hours of the crime being committed, it may well be that they have trace evidence on them. For example, blood or fibres on their clothing. So it's really important that this evidence is recovered as soon as possible. Fingernail scrapings and fingernail cuttings will be taken. If there's any injuries to the hand or any obvious blood on someone's hands, that will be swabbed. And then if they don't have a DNA record, their a DNA sample is taken. And this is referred to as the reference DNA sample to be able to potentially link that back to either the victim or the crime scene. At the forensic lab, scientists compare the suspect's DNA samples against the haul of weapons seized from the crime scene, whilst the detectives begin the interview process. Every single one of them said nothing. It's clear that there has been conversation to not say anything. So you're working off nothing from the suspects at all. And that's when you look at all the other things that build up your investigation. The morning after the attack, police allocate further resources to the crime scene. It's very, very important to visit the scene, understand it. What is the area around it? What's the infrastructure like? Look at CCTV options yourself and just make sure that you know your officers are doing what they're supposed to be doing with the CCTV retrieval. So this is where Jay Sewell was stabbed. And this, where he was actually stabbed took place back there towards that last fence in the road. That's where the huge melee took place. Officers would be going door to door, trying to identify people that might have seen or heard something that evening. Some people have CCTV, some is working, some is not. Some CCTV is not facing the right direction, but it can be relevant if it sees somebody making off in a certain way. While Simon's team scour the area of the CCTV, detectives interview Jay's family. Yeah, he got on with everybody. Very happy boy, happy-go-lucky. <laughs> He always used to be at parties. That's where he made all his friends. Parties. He had so many friends. It's ridiculous. Girls always warm to him and that. You know, he'd walk into a bar and he'd walk out with two or three of them. He's <laughs> your typical lad. He was quite a good looking boy. So, you know, like the girls used to like him a lot. Police learn that on Friday the 7th of December 2018, just four days before his murder, Jay started seeing a girl named Gemma. I think it was through one of his friends, you know, just in the pub. I think they had a few drinks together and it just went from there. I saw very briefly that Gemma... I didn't have the story. I didn't know. I'd just seen this girl um, in Jay's room for about ten minutes on the Saturday. I didn't know it was to do with her, I didn't know it was all surrounding her. It is revealed that she had recently come out of a long-term relationship with Daniel Grogan, who is still on the run. 
This was a relationship off and on with Daniel Grogan for two and a half years and it had finished. She was trying to say goodbye, let me move on, but he wasn't having any of it. Daniel was unhappy that Gemma had broken off the relationship. For young people in particular, a breakup can feel like a very personal attack. She was painting a picture of Daniel Grogan as a deeply jealous, violent, possessive ex-boyfriend. And you look at that as the potential motive to start with. At the crime scene, detectives are acquiring CCTV footage and the forensic teams continue to search for the murder weapon, which may provide vital clues to help identify Jay's killer. A key thing to work out is where your suspects have run, either into the scene or out of the scene, because at any stage they could discard something, personal property, drop something, or importantly discard one of the weapons that could yield some forensic evidence You've got bushes, you've got anything where something needed to be searched that essentially could have a weapon inside. The scene is, is large, so you are also starting from a point where you don't exactly know all the weapons that were involved. So quite a large number of exhibits were seized from gardens with an understanding they could have been used. And obviously, as you go along, you realise that, that a lot of them weren't. So you do end up with quite a significant amount of exhibits seized and taken back to be seen if they were relevant or not. On the other side of the railway line is the Grogan family home. A second CSI team is assigned to search this location. Upon entering, police find blood on a door handle. Now, of course, you don't know whose blood that is. They do a, what's called a presumptive test to make sure that it is blood and that's, it comes back as blood straight away. So we know that's unusual. If there's been a quite a sustained attack on a victim, the offender may well have blood on their hands. Finding blood inside a house, particularly on a door handle, if it's the victim's blood, may, will then link that person or that door handle or the house to the victim. Swabs of the blood on the door handle are sent away to establish a profile and further incriminating evidence is discovered in the family home. In the upstairs parents' bedroom, there is a pair of jeans which has blood on. There is other items of clothing such as a hoodie uh, that has got blood on. We also found some tissues which had blood on. And because of we know what's happened, you expect that that blood on that tissue has come from a wound or where some item has been cleaned. But you don't know whose blood that is. You don't know if it's the victims or somebody else that might have bled during the attack. So these items of clothing with blood on or swabs that have been taken of the blood on the door handle are sent up as priority exhibits to the laboratory so that in the quickest available time we can identify whose blood that is. With the offenders having fled from the attack site to the family home, Police turn their attention to the area in between. As you go along the route, items wrapped in tea towels can be seen strewn along the pathway. The tea towels contain hammers, but not the murder weapon police are looking for. The priority is to find that knife. The second stab victim, Charlie, has been discharged from hospital and the digital forensic team begin to analyze the mobile phones seized from the suspects in custody. You use the data that is on those phones, such as text messages or calls, to work out where that phone was at the time. Every time the phone needs to connect to the network, it gets a signal from the nearest mast or cell. We do a survey in terms of the reach of every cell um, and the direction that every cell would cover, because every cell sort of covers a little bit more than 120 degrees. By knowing which cell and the angle it connected and then finding the next cell that it connected to and then the next cell that it connected to, we can probably map where the phone might be situated. Cell site analysis places the suspect's phones on Sibthorpe Road and Allwald Crescent on the night Jay was murdered. But CCTV evidence is recovered 
that could place them all at the crime scene. We know that Jay was attacked around about quarter to ten that evening. In this particular case, we were fortunate to have CCTV from other houses in the locality. And what it showed us was a, a degree of movement around the time that Jay was killed. You can see my son and his friends trying to get away from him. It was just horrific. It was a pack of wolves essentially attacking. Officers have arrested members of the Grogan family after witnesses claimed they were involved in the attack where 18-year-old Jay Sewell was murdered. But 20-year-old Daniel Grogan and his friend, 26-year-old Charlie Dudley, are still outstanding. Officers believe Daniel may have instigated the attack after discovering that Jay had started dating his ex-girlfriend just four days ago. Jay's family reminisce about the time they spent with him on the day he was murdered. On the day, he asked me to, um, whether I'd lend him some money to... to pay for, to, to help him get presents for his family, you know? A few hours before, my son's sitting on the sofa and the next second, you know, a few hours later, to go and view your child that's been stabbed to death on a slab. It, uh, oh. I, I had no clue as to what was really behind it all at that point. I, I didn't know nothing. All I knew is that my son was dead. The search for Daniel Grogan, Charlie Dudley, and the murder weapon intensifies. Specialists compare the CCTV footage against the clothing seized from the suspects in custody. You could see the person in the shorts, Jamie Bennett, Francesca's boyfriend. You could see Francesca, the women stood out. Mum was in a dressing gown, Francesca wasn't, and she was the other female there. Then you could see a very tall person, which was Charlie Dudley. And you could see other people, the younger ones, the cousins. Then in CCTV, you see them run. They all run. And you can see they are carrying items in their hands, such as wood or these hammers. And you can see each one of them and the role they played as they ran across the bridge. At the crime scene itself, where Jay was stabbed, you had minimal CCTV. Only a slight slither of CCTV from a house. There were axes being swung, bricks being thrown, bits of wood, uh, hammers. It really was really unpleasant and, and incredibly ferocious. Anne Grogan, the mother of Daniel Grogan, was running out to attack people in a dressing gown. You could see her in possession of a knife. But what you could see is that she wasn't in that position where she was the person that killed Jay Sewell. The woman, the mother, used to work at the school where my son went as well. And it's unbelievable. The father, Robert Grogan, he could be seen on CCTV swinging an axe towards people, but it wasn't clear enough at all to see anyone stabbing Jay. All those people was against one. Just, that's all they wanted was him. Didn't want nobody else, but all because he was seeing his ex-girlfriend. You just can't believe it. Further analysis of the CCTV helps police paint a picture of what has occurred. We started to get the idea about Jay was stabbed as he was getting back into the car. But who was that person? A person was seen, but they didn't have their face open. It was covered up. And that proved difficult for um, identification. Of course, at that stage, you have no idea 
who killed Jay Shaw. In the end, when she decided to drive off, they're still punching, smashing the car. You know, my, my son's, well, he might have even been dead then, you know, and they're still doing it. The offenders flee back across the footbridge and CCTV picks them up from the other side of the railway track, where they make off in the direction of the Grogan family home. The main suspect's house backed onto the railway line. It then becomes really important to then search the area around the railway track to see if there's any evidence that might have been dropped. Police hope the knife used to stab Jay may have been discarded here, as such a discovery could ultimately identify his killer. When you're searching an area like this, you are in real danger. These tracks, when my teams were searching, remained live. We had people positioned quite a distance away to warn them when trains were coming. And this was just to find any item that we could that may have been discarded. Which involved some very large machinery to cut back that area. And it was within that undergrowth that we found a knife. Finding a potential murder weapon as a knife is a really good source of forensic information. There would be potential for touch DNA on the handle from the suspect and also fingerprints. There may be blood on the blade of the knife or also fingerprints on the blade. And also, even if the weapon's been cleaned, sometimes between the handle and the blade, you get blood and fibres caught in that area. The swabs are run through the database and the forensic pathologist compares the knife to the injuries of both victims. The actual blade itself was of a length that was similar to the uh, length of the wounds that had been uh, inflicted on Jay and Charlie. As the evidence starts to build, a call comes through to the incident room. Daniel Grogan has handed himself in to the police. A jealous gutter rat. That man should never ever be back in society. Charlie Dudley was another suspect who was said to be very, very involved in the violence itself. Finding him was a little bit more complex and we had to engage certain methods to try and trace where he might be. Using specialist intel, police track Charlie Dudley to South End in Essex where he's arrested. With their two outstanding suspects in custody, police seize their phones to look for any incriminating evidence. Messages retrieved from Daniel Grogan's phone contain violent threats towards his ex-girlfriend around the time she first met Jay. All the messages, all the threats, everything he does digitally is recorded and it's, it's retrievable. So many abusive text messages and voice messages where the threats were there against her life, against her friend's life, against Jay's life. He wanted to be as threatening as possible. Detectives learn Grogan also inflicted physical abuse when his then-girlfriend called off the relationship. He had physically dragged her, kicked her, punched her, threatened her family. You know, he's bordering psychotic and, and is incredibly dangerous at that point. It appears that Grogan simply can't live with the idea that Gemma would be in a relationship with somebody else and is willing to go to very extreme lengths to stop that. The build-up of the jealousy and the hatred for Jay over time appears to be all-consuming. Further text messages are recovered from Daniel's phone, showing the threats of violence turning towards Jay. He made threats against Jay's family. He'd never met the family. Some really, really sinister and disgusting threats. He had contacted him and said that he knew that Chloe went to Betsy Heath's school and he had arranged for a number of boys to come kidnap her and rape her. And then they were going to come and burn the house down. Jay would never tolerate anyone 
So even threatening any part of the family, especially his little sister. He's very, very proud of his little sister, uh, proud of all of us, really, and yeah, it protects us to the hill. I think what was arranged, that he was going over there to sort of have a sort out between him and this boy, you know? I imagine that Jay's decision to meet and confront Daniel was on the basis that he just thought that his mouth was bigger than his intentions and that he could try and just put a stop to this. So he, he must have made that assessment and unfortunately it was the wrong assessment in this case. I think Jay always liked not to bother me too much, but he was in danger. He was in danger. The girlfriend's statements to police helps build a picture of the arranged meetup between her, Jay, and Daniel Grogan. She wanted to meet Daniel Grogan, say to him, enough is enough, come on. You know, we had a relationship, I want to move on now. But she didn't want to do it in the road right outside the house to avoid the family getting involved. And so she wanted to meet more neutrally, which was across the railway bridge in Old World Crescent. As it turned out, it wasn't, it wasn't far enough away. Would he have gone over there if he knew they were going to get hammers and they were going to get knives and they were going to and they were going to stab him in a car? Would he have gone? Of course he went off. Digital forensic experts collate a timeline using the phone data analysis and CCTV. What you can see is is Daniel Grogan. You can spot him amongst all these people, and what you can see around about ten to ten. Daniel Grogan's phone lights up. And that corresponds with a text that Gemma has sent him to say, we're here, we're in Old World Crescent. As soon as that message hits Daniel's phone, that's when he then calls on his family to get over there and help him. This text message indicates Daniel Grogan is the instigator behind the attack. But it still isn't clear who committed the fatal stabbing on Jay or why the rest of the Grogan family got involved. Police hope the forensic findings will be able to determine Jay's killer. The blood on the door handle of the Grogan family home returns from the lab with Jamie Bennett's DNA. This to me then suggests that Jamie Bennett has been injured at some stage during the attack on Jay. It's quite likely on such a frenzied attack that the offenders would also be injured themselves. So finding Jamie Bennett's DNA cements that knowledge. It gave us evidence against Jamie Bennett, but it still wasn't that bit where we've put the victim's DNA back inside the house to say whoever was in that house was involved in the murder of Jay Sewell. DNA found on the bloodstained jeans matches to Robert Grogan and Daniel Grogan. Jay Sewell's DNA is also found on the jeans. It's not straightforward still to say, OK, the person wearing those jeans was the murderer, because they could just literally have come into close contact with somebody that had Jay Sewell's blood on. So a really significant piece of information and piece of evidence, but still not enough to say who that person was that murdered Jay. The DNA forensic results from the suspected murder weapon return with Charlie Dudley's DNA. But there is no trace of Jay Sewell. If there's no forensic evidence on the knife that links that to the murder of Jay, then a defence could easily argue that that knife had been dropped innocently within the crime scene. Despite a mountain of evidence placing the suspects at the crime scene, police still cannot prove who killed Jay. The investigation reaches that point now where we haven't identified the murderer to put a charge against anybody in that group. But that's not the end of it. What we're doing is building a case against everybody involved there. And so you look at joint enterprise. If somebody carries a knife for somebody else and that that knife is then used by the other person to kill somebody, they are both guilty of murder. It's a joint enterprise. The suspects are all charged with the murder of Jay Sewell by Joint Enterprise, and detectives continue to build a picture of how an entire family became embroiled in such an horrific crime.
Daniel Grogan, threatened to burn down Jay Saul's house. But he told his family that Jay had threatened to burn their house down. If my son had come to me that night and said to me, oh, there's people that are going to come over here and, and bomb the house, firebomb the house, my first thing would have been, well, I think it's a bluff. And if they're turned up, I'm going to call the police. Despite not being able to determine who killed Jay Sewell, police have charged several members of the same family and their associates for murder by joint enterprise. Jay comes from a, a nice family. He was trying to do the right thing with his friends. And, and what happened to him was a, an awful situation. Things like that spur us on to do everything we can to bring that person in front of a court. Six months after Jay's murder, the court case begins and Jay's family come face to face with his attackers. I, I can't even describe to you the anger when you're up there and you're looking at them and you're just seeing it, you, I mean, you can't even take your eyes off of them. With multiple defendants on trial, the court case becomes increasingly complex. It was one of the probably most difficult trials I think a family would have to go through to listen to the lies and the cross-blaming uh, of these people as they stood trial. Every defendant in that family had a separate barrister who was arguing their case every time a witness came on. So one witness with a prosecution and then nine different people at some stage put in their version of events. Unable to link any of the defendants to a knife that ultimately killed Jay, the prosecution present a plethora of other weapons used in the attack that includes an axe carried by Robert Grogan. You know, you got a, what was he, 56, 57-year-old man swinging an axe. You know, he, he, on the stand he said to, he, he was, it was a controlled swing. It's unbelievable. At that age, go ran acting like they did. The choice of the weapons used can cause very serious harm. That the parents were willing to get involved in this way might indicate that there's a shared morality where they think it's OK to carry out this violent behaviour. The court hears how Francesca Grogan and her partner Jamie Bennett admit to carrying the hammers found at the attack site. But they claim they did not intend on using them. Friends and family have strong ties, commitment, camaraderie and support for one another. Pack mentality is a social phenomenon where different group members can influence one another to think and behave in similar ways. The in-group is the members of the pack or the herd. The out-group is anybody that's not involved in that group. As the prosecution present their evidence, the Grogan family turn on the out-group member of their pack. Charlie Dudley, who is not related to them. The family closed ranks, trying to suggest it was him that had killed Jay Sewell. The court hears how the knife recovered from the railway tracks at the back of the Grogan home could have caused the injuries to Jay. But as it only had the DNA of Charlie Dudley on it, the knife could not be forensically linked to Jay's murder. In their defence, the Grogan family claimed they were protecting themselves from Jay Sewell. Daniel Grogan threatened to burn down Jay Sewell's house, but he told his family that Jay had threatened to burn their house down just to get them whipped up into this frenzy, this pack of wolves mentality that then meant that they would attack anybody that threatened their family. If my son had come to me that night and said to me, oh, there's people that are going to come over here and, and bomb the house, firebomb the house, my first thing would have been, well, I think it's a bluff. And if they're turned up, I would have called the police. We have a natural instinct to protect ourselves and the ones that we love, and Grogan has managed to use that to his advantage. By instilling fear in his family and friends in this way, he's managed to recruit them to help him to attack Saul. 
The level of Daniel Grogan's manipulation becomes apparent when the court hears the details of his incriminating text messages. He gave him a load of lies and when the texts were sort of like started to get read out because it was a great big massive book of them and the mum, she threw it on the floor like she didn't want to hear it. After a long three-month trial, the jury return with a verdict. Francesca Grogan and Jamie Bennett are convicted of violent disorder. Francesca Grogan is sentenced to 12 months in prison. Jamie Bennett is sentenced to 20 months in prison. Daniel Grogan's cousin, Liam Hickey, is also convicted of violent disorder and GBH and is sentenced to three years in prison. Anne Grogan was convicted of seven and a half years for the manslaughter of Jay and three and a half years for violent disorder. The father, Robert Grogan, was found guilty and given 14 and a half years for manslaughter and six years for the GBH, grievous bodily harm, on Charlie Pamphlet. Charlie Dudley is convicted of manslaughter and sentenced to 16 years in prison. The wealth of evidence proving Daniel Grogan's intent and that he was the main instigator was enough to convince the jury he was culpable for Jay's murder. Daniel Grogan received life imprisonment with a minimum sentence of 21 years. He also received five years for grievous bodily harm and a further three years for violent disorder. Ultimately, everything he did, all the threats he made, all the actions he took led to Jay's murder. If it wasn't for Daniel Grogan, no matter who else was there, Jay Shaw would still be alive. I wonder, do they have any remorse? Do they, can they sleep at night? taking an 18-year-old boy's life away because their son was unstable and couldn't get over a relationship. They should have sat that boy down and spoke to him. But they just picked up their weapons and went out there. It's just not fair, is it? Because he'll come out in a few years and he'll go and live his life. And Jay would have made such an impact on the world. It's just not fair. Even with Jay's attackers behind bars, nothing will bring back the teenager who had his whole life ahead of him. I think that day when Jay died, there was a massive part of Mum that also died that day. I don't think my mum would ever be the same, obviously, because she lost her son. I can't imagine how she feels. Like, losing a brother is something, but losing a son that you've carried for nine months and been with for 18 years. It's, it's depressing. I'm never going to see my son again. I can't even have a picture up of my son in the house because he makes me cry. The only place I got him is, is there and uh, picture him in my purse. If someone's willing to go out with a knife, then they're that type of person that wants to use a knife. What, what can you say to someone like that? It all needs to stop. Just knife crime, it just, it's not worth it. Because if you take that life, it ain't just their life that you've destroyed. You've destroyed, you know, a whole family's life and even your own. And it's just, it just needs to stop. It's something that you always think is going to happen to someone else. You hear about it all the time. There's a violent culture out there now. And, and it's affecting everybody. I'm sorry, this is going to be difficult. People don't want to be sitting where I am. It's not a good place to be.